Welcome back. In this lecture 18, I will discuss reversible deactivation radical polymerizations or in short RDRP. These are the topics which I plan to cover and the full form of these terms will be discussed uh, when necessary. So, let us start with this RDRP polymerization, reversible deactivation radical polymerization and earlier this polymerization used to be known as living radical polymerization or control radical polymerization. So, all three polymerizations like living radical polymerization or control radical polymerization or RDRP are basically of same type of polymerization. Now, let us go back and discuss what was the kinetics or three steps of radical chain polymerization. We have learned that the chain polymerization consists of three steps. First one is initiation, second one is propagation and third one is termination. Now, in case somehow we can remove this termination step which produced dead polymers. Then what happens? Then this propagating radical will continue to propagate without undergoing any termination reaction. And for time being, let us also assume that there is no chain transfer reaction in the system. So, in absence of any termination and chain transfer reaction, this propagating radical will continue to polymerize as long as monomers are present in the system. So, the lifetime of these radicals, propagating radicals which are in conventional radical polymerization is about 0.1 second to 10 seconds. In this case, we can actually prolong the lifetime of this radical in hours or even, even so on as long as there is no termination reaction. So, as a result what will happen that this will remain living and if we, we can actually end up this polymerization when all the monomers are over, we can do some reaction on that active radical and generate functional group and we can also add second monomer and restart the polymerization reaction forming a block copolymer. And of course, now if we know how many number of radicals were initially produced which initiated a polymerization chain and by knowing that we know how many polymer chains actually produced at the end of polymerization and a result we can or we will be able to estimate the number of molecular weight. It means molecular weight values for this resulting polymer and if necessary we can control the molecular weight. But in practice it is very difficult to remove or completely eliminate this bimolecular interaction between two radicals because they are very react reactive to each other. So, in practice we can actually bring this termination reaction to a negligibly low value. How can you do that? We know the termination reaction is proportional to square of the concentration of this radical. So, if you somehow decrease the concentration of these radicals in the system, then the termination reaction will come down drastically. So, we can bring down this termination reaction by decreasing the concentration of n dot to a very low value. Now, what is the fallback or fallout of this step? We also know that rate of polymerization of rate of propagation is given by this expression. 
which is directly proportional to the concentration of radicals in the system propagating radicals. And if we reduce this concentration then obviously, the polymerization reaction or polymerization rate also will come down. So, you can ask or you can question that if we use a small amount of initiator molecule. So, that when they dissociate completely they generate small amount of or very low amount of this initiating radical then this is also applies and we can get a low amount of a low concentration of m dot in that case. But in that case of course, the termination reaction will come down because your number of radicals in the systems are low. But what happened at the end of polymerization once the monomers are over the radicals propagating radicals will will definitely interact with each other and form dead polymer chain. So, there is no scope of further using that radical for making block copolymer. So, this this will form dead chain not living chain. Secondly, because the radicals will generate with time there will be the 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 chains which are produced in that case if you use very small amount of initiator the chains will have different length because the starting point of each chains will be different as the initiator generates or radicals generates. As a result the distribution of molecular weight will be also very high. So, to avoid that problem especially if we want to have a considerable polymerization rate practical from practical point of view if we want to have a acceptable polymerization rate we cannot basically use a very small amount of initiator and suppress the radical concentration. We have to use a definite acceptable amount of initiator so that this rate also increases. So, what is the way out? Way out by reversibly trapping and temporarily deactivating these chain radicals. I will discuss little detail in this uh, two cases. And in this case the reversible trapping and temporarily deactivating the chain radicals by which we can now decrease the concentration of this uh, propagating radical. And this reversible activation deactivation cycle must be very rapid. So, kinetic must be very fast and at any point uh, end point of time equilibrium, equilibrium should be towards the deactivated species. So, that effectively a radical spend more time as a deactivated species rather than active species. As I mentioned that earlier this used to be mentioned as living radical polymerization, but as I explained it now it is actually not a truly living because there will be some bimolecular termination reaction. So, we cannot say that it is a completely living radical polymerization we can say quasi or pseudo living polymerization. And then the researcher used to call this as control radical polymerization because you can control the polymerization, but to avoid all these uh, terminologies in about 2009 um, IUPAC came with this nomenclature which actually captured the mechanism mechanistic aspect of this polymerization which basically talked about reversible deactivation of the propagating radical. Now, there are two strategies by which we can actually uh, do this reversible deactivation one by reversible termination. Now, reversible in this process reversible end capping of the chain radical by a chain capping species. For example, this is a propagating chain and this chain is capped with a chain capping species which is shown here with this blue circle. Now, this can dissociate and produce a radical 
and radical from this species. Now, here this is chosen such a way that this radical cannot react with the monomer and start a polymerization chain. It can only react with this radical propagating radical and basically make a dormant species that means this does not do any polymerization reaction. And this is chosen such a way that this equilibrium is more towards this dormant species. Now, once this radical generates the time the time it is spent as a radical species it can capture another monomer or more few monomers and basically propagate the chain and again it can react with this radical to make this dormant species. So, basically in this case this radical captures monomers from the medium and propagate the chain, but this radical or the propagating radical spend most of the time in dormant species. So, that the concentration effective concentration of this propagating radical comes down in the medium. And as you can see at the end of the polymerization, we can have this molecule with a capped with this and we can use this further for making a block of polymer or we can basically do some reaction on this end to make functional polymers as well. And if we start most of the chains a similar time, then all the resulting polymers will be of nearly same molecular weight. So, the molecular distribution would be also narrow. So, this, this is rapid reversible exchange between the active, this is the active and dormant states and the, we will give you example of uh, the stable free radical polymerization F S F R P or it is also called nitroxide mediated radical polymerization NMP and AT, ATRP or atom transfer radical polymerization. These are the polymerization techniques which follow this reversible termination strategy. There could be another strategy where reversible transfer. In this case, we basically have one propagating polymer chain and it basically reacts with another dormant chain which has a propagating polymer chain capped with the n chemical species. Now, this can react with this and knock this out make a radical to produce a radical. So, this is producing a radical and also this radical and this radical propag original propagating radical actually captures this and there is an equilibrium between these two. So, in this way I will describe this when we talk about RA raft polymerization in more detail. So, in this case the number of chains which are propagating actually determined by the number of this end capping chain end capping species present in the medium in most cases and this exchange is high efficient exchange reaction and if we use this stepping agent in much higher number than the originally or primary radicals generated from the initiator, then each chain we can grow, we can actually can grow approximately of equal prob probability with a very short burst of activity. So, that we can get a narrow polydispersity. And we will give you the example of radical uh, addition fragmentation transfer polymerization or raft polymerization. Now, this uh, there are some general features for this uh, RDRP process. 
there is no irreversible chain transfer and chain termination as we explained. The rate of chain initiation is much higher compared to rate of chain propagation and chain grows at a more constant rate than seen in the radical chain polymerization. And both yield and molecular weight of the polymers produced increases with reaction time or conversion. Just this is a difference as we have seen as we have seen for conventional radi chain, um, radical chain polymerization with conversion or time and if we talk about molecular weight we have seen that initially the molecular weight actually goes up and slowly it comes down because in case of conventional radical polymerization from beginning itself because the lifetime of this radical propagating radicals as I mentioned is 0.1 second to 10 seconds. So, basically these radicals stay live for this small duration and they do reaction and basically do propagation and then they react with each other this radical reacts with each other and form dead chain the polymer chains. So, we can get a high molecular weight polymer chain from the beginning itself and with time as the concentration of monomer and concentration of initiator comes down this molecular weight actually comes down. But in case of RDRP process we can this molecular weight and the yield actually continue to increase linearly with conversion conversation a conversion sorry. And polymer chains uh, which are produced in by this process are nearly equal. So, we have a very low dispersity and we can actually determine the molar mass uh, before the reaction. We can actually target a particular molar mass or molecular weight and polymer as we explained that we can synthesize polymers in different stages. So, that we can make block copolymer and we can have control over n groups. So, once we reaction is over we can do some chemical reaction to modify the end group. And some more general features is first order kinetics is followed with respect to monomer. So, if we plot uh, ln m naught by m where m naught is the initial monomer concentration this is the monomer concentration at time t with uh, time we get a linear increase uh, this is what we call conversion with time. So, this is a conversion is equal this which basically linearly increases with time. The as we explained that the degree of polymerization of the molecular weight actually increases uh, linearly with conversion value and the molecular distribution is also very narrow. So, if we plot uh, molecular weight m n or x n degree of polymerization with a conversion then we get a linear we get a linear uh, curve. So, basically molecular weight increases conversion. So, basically these are the parameters which we can monitor to basically prove or to establish that the whatever you are doing the polymerization you are doing are actually following this mechanism and this is uh, what is uh, polydispersity. So, polydispersity index or dispersity actually comes down as we increase conversion or as we increase the molecular weight, but finally we can get very narrow polydispersity even less than 1.1 we can get because the num the polymers which we are generating are are very their their size or molecular weight of the, these uh, polymers are almost equal in nature. So we'll talk about uh, first example where we talk about stable free radical polymerization, SFRP or nitroxide mediated uh, radical polymerization. So, in this case we this is the presently what is how it is done a, a nitroxide with a 
R1 R group is basically this can dissociate under certain condition producing a radical and a nitroxide. Now, this is a very stable radical, this do not react with itself or with the monomers, it actually only reacts with the original radicals from which it is produced to form the original initiating species. And this equilibrium is this is chosen such a way that this is on mostly on the left hand side. So, basically this is mainly the species present in the medium. So, non radical species are present mainly in the Indian, the radical concentration is very low. Now, once this is formed, it can react with uh, few monomer and basically propagate the polymer chain and which again can react with this uh, stable radical. This is the stable radical and generate the uh, dormant species and which again can dissociate like this step and this cycle can go on. So, basically this cycle can go on and we can generate longer and longer polymer chain and with time as a result with time the molecular weight increases. So, some example this is tempo radical a uh, very stable radical originally it was uh, used for uh, first synthesis by this method where um, polystyrene was synthesized at 125 degree centigrade bulk method. Originally this was not the way SFRP was synthesized this was added from externally and some other radical initiator was initiation step was used to initiate this radical initiator radical. But later on this was found to be more uh, more effective way to do this polymerization where the stable radical can be produced from the monomer adduct with the monomer species. And in terms of conversion here also conversion is directly linearly related to time and we can actually predict the molecular weight by the dividing the uh, the monomer which is basically converted. So, if m 0 is my initial monomer concentration and c is the fractional monomer convention. So, out of say 100 if 90 percent of monomer is consumed, so c will be 0 0.9 and if all the monomers are consumed c will be 1. So, if you if you actually do the reaction to a competition level c will be 1. So, we can just directly divide the initial monomer concentration with the ratio of this species to find out what is the expected degree of polymerization. Because this gives the concent initial concentration of these molecules gives the number of polymer chains which are producing at the end of this polymerization. So, if you divide by the number of monomers with the number of polymer chains produced you can get the degree of polymerization. We will talk about the second method atom transfer radical polymerization. So, in this case an organic halide undergoes a reversible redox process catalyzed by a transition metal compound such as cuprous halide. So, in this case we have an organic halide and a transition metal compound which is have a ligand associated with this. So, in case of this we have a copper compound. So, this now react with in it themselves to produce a radical and basically oxidize copper is oxidized to make a cupric bromide we along with the ligand which is present with this ion. And again this is a very fast exchange process this dynamic equilibrium is very fast and it is more towards the dormant species. So, the equilibrium is such that at any point of time the number of radical the, the tendency of R being in radical form will be lower compared to in this dormant form which does not propagate a polymer chain. Now, once this radical is formed it can react with monomers and 
do a propag few propagation step and then again this can react with this uh, cupric bromide and get reduced to form alkyl halide. And then this can do similar cycle and then as the cycle proceeds more and more cycle we can get this uh, the higher in the chain length. Some of these alkyl halides organic halides are shown here and some of the ligand which are used uh, for this purpose uh, shown here. And in this case also the conversion is uh, this uh, T is missing. So, is related to uh, the time linearly related to time and uh, in this case also we can basically estimate the degree of polymerization by dividing the fractional monomer conversion with the initial concentration of alkyl bromide organic halide because this is what determines how many numbers of polymer chain will be produced at the end of the polymerization. And this is how we can get the polydispersity which is given by 1 by 1 by e x n. Now, we can use as I was explaining that we can take this uh, at the end of the polymerization we will have this uh, alkyl halide with a uh, this bromide or uh, other halides at the end of the polymer chain and we can actually use this for synthesizing lots of functional polymers and some of the examples are given. One example that we can react with this molecule we can even generate macro monomer. So, basically we have a long polymer chain and we have a polymerizable group at the end of the polymer chain. So, now we can actually um, uh, basically we can actually polymerize then this polymer this group to form a further polymerization. So, that is why it is called macro monomer. So, there are other way like you can generate azide functional and n group functionalized polymers which can be further reacted with many other cases uh, many other uh, reagents to form other functional groups like amine and so on. We can actually generate a block copolymer like if we use uh, say R x and uh, a copper halide then we can generate uh, first block and then we can again add the second monomer to make the block copolymer of N A and then B. Similarly, we can use a, a like molecule like we have two both sides uh, this uh, bromide or halide and use this ligand ligand is there then we can actually make block copolymer from both the sides and then we can add B. So, we make a middle block with A. So, we can have a A with a middle block A and other side we can actually make So, we can basically make the other block which is B B B B in both sides. So, we can have actually tri block in this case. We can also have um, take a tri 3 bromide group and we can make basically star polymer and we can actually use this to functionalize or make a graft copolymer like this which is shown here. So, we will come to the last uh, example of this RDLP where we are talking about a radical addition fragmentation transfer polymerization. Now, in this case uh, polymerization carried out with conventional initiators such as peroxide or AIBN. So, basically the radicals are generated in more conventional way like thermal initiation of peroxides or AIBN in presence of a chain transfer agent which is also called raft agent. So, basically we can have a conventional way of generating this radical in presence of this raft agent. Now, what is the 
characteristics of this uh, react agent that this initial initiating radical and when we homolytically clip this bond it will generate a dot or a radical the reactivity of this original r radical and a radical must be similar so that the reaction rate actually does not happen and there will be a dynamic equilibrium between the propagating radical and a dormant radical we will come to that. The z group must be activating this exchange process and wrapped region must be highly reactive in chain transfer. So, basically this will react with this and transfer the chain. So, basically the wrapped region must be highly reactive in chain transfer process. So, basically when initially this radical generates it can actually react with this raft agent like this it can attack this and generate an intermediate radical and then so basically it is a addition step and then this homolytically this SA bond can homolytically clip and generating this fragment. So, basically we are talking about addition and then fragmentation and all these steps are reversible. So, basically that is why we are calling this as a reversible addition for fragmentation. So, but and doing this we are basically transferring the original radical to a new radical. So, that is basically why we are calling this as a transfer. Now, initially this can also react with some monomers to generate or propagate and generate a uh, basically a, a radical which is a propagating chain and which can react with this uh, chain transfer agent as well. But beginning at initially basically this concentration of these raft agents are used much higher than the original radical. So, basically once this generates it reacts or with monomer, but it also reacts mostly with this chain transfer agents and form this type of adduct and this a dot which now can react with again with a monomer to generate propagating chain. So, immediately after some time like when few percentage of monomer is used up or consumed most of these chain transfer agents will be reacted consumed and we will have some propagating chain and which will have the raft agent will have the raft agent at the end. So, after like once we start the polymerization immediately after 1 or 2 percent of monomer conversion all this chain transfer reaction will consume and we get some oligomeric chain with the N as wrapped agent. Now, once we have these wrapped agents and as we said the total number of wrapped agent is much more than total number of primary radical. So, basically the number of chains which gets produced at the end of the polymerization is mainly determined by this number of raft agents which is used up because this determines how many number of uh, what is the number of polymers chains which are produced at the end of the polymerization. Like if I start with one reaction one R it is giving another A. Now, if it reacts with a new chain transfer reagent then it will produce another radical. So, number of radicals remain same during the reaction which is given by the number of primary radical, but number of polymer chains is given by the number of raft agents which are produced plus of course, there will be few more because of the presence of this uh, propagating radical which basically terminates by doing reaction among themselves. So, these are the some of the 
raft agents uh, which are um, typically used uh, in laboratories. These are dithioester reagents. So, basically it is a thioester and there is a S missing here. So, this is dithioester. We can have a trithioester group which can basically generates a tri block or di block copolymer and we can have dithiocarbomate wrap present, we can have also have uh, this uh, xanthate type wrap agents also and when you use xanthate type we call this as a matrix polymerization. So, what we will do, I will we'll stop this for time being uh, uh, for this lecture and this next lecture I will start from this page and uh, talk little more about this radical uh, addition fragmentation transfer reaction.